My name is Mazen Beg. I am a, uh, an outreach director for the organisation CAGE, which advocates for people uh, detained unjustly in the war on terror. I was detained and held in Guantanamo Bay from between 2002 to 2005 by the United States. I was born and raised in the United Kingdom in Great Britain. My parents originated uh, from Pakistan and uh, it was in the city of Birmingham where I first went to school, to a Jewish school, where I, uh, during the day, celebrated and uh, practiced part of the Jewish religion that was taught in the school. We've celebrated Pesach and Purim and Yom Kippur and Hanukkah during the day, and read from the Torah and learn from Hebrew. And in the evening, I'd go home to read and learn from the Quran. So I understood um, the diversity of various beliefs growing up in Britain, which was, of course, a Christian country. And I also understood how I was regarded or began to become regarded as somebody who was not really accepted as part of Britain during those years in the 70s and the 80s. And it was during that period that, uh, when I went to a, uh, uh, my secondary school or my high school, as you would call it in America, where I first encountered proper racism. And the racism at the time wasn't focused as it is today towards just any particular faith group like Muslims. It was anybody who happened to be targeted because of how they looked, how they appeared. In fact, the extremist or the quote-unquote terrorist community at that time um, were white Caucasians called Irish people. And that's because of Irish Republican terrorism that was going across and being carried out across uh, the United Kingdom. During my late teen years or mid-teen years, I ended up joining a street gang uh, which was called The Lynx. And we, we meaning uh, young South Asians, blacks, and even Irish guys, got together and had to fight off the rise of uh, what was known at that time as the National Front and the British movement, which essentially were racist neo-Nazis who would march up and down the streets um, saying, Packies out. And this was as a result of me, myself, being physically beaten up by them, my brother being beat, beaten up by them, other relatives. And it was part of a journey the journey that eventually took me to um, trying to understand who I was, where I fit in. Was I British? Was I Asian? Was I Muslim? Was I Pakistani? Did I belong and who was I? There was a, a, a conflagration of all these conflicting views. On the one hand, you're being told by racists uh, often, Paki, go home. But you know home is exactly in the same city where he lives. And on the other hand, trying to figure out um, what it meant to be a Muslim who is part of a wide community that transcends race and transcends uh, language and transcends borders. And as I began to grow and understand, it was my Muslim identity that I started to connect with more. Um, it's important that people understand that Britain, in my view, is one of the best countries, perhaps the best country, in the Western world to be a Muslim or to be anything else. And although a person during those years, those teenage years, those rebellious years, tries to challenge that idea of where they fit in and what their identity is, in hindsight, I look back and, and see that it helped to develop me and my views as a person. All of that, going to a Jewish school, going to a Christian school, being a part of a gang, um, being my father's son, all of those things for me made me who I am, quite uniquely, um, as everybody's unique, but certainly part of the British story. And being Muslim is also part of the British story, though today there's a lies, rise in Islamophobia and attacks against Muslims um, from at governmental level or on street level. Being Muslim is part of being British, and it has been for a very long time and will be for the futures to come. In the mid-90s, uh, when the Bosnian conflict uh, began, it was the first time that I understood that there were white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Muslims who were being massacred and butchered in the heart of Europe simply because of their names. That their name was Ahmadovic or Izzetbegovic or whatever it was. Um, and that they were Slavic, that they had been essentially um, assimilated into the former Yugoslavian society, and that now once the breakup had happened of that country, 
the Bosnian Muslims were literally being uh, uh, ethnically cleansed and a genocide was taking place right under our noses. I met several of the refugees who had come here, including a woman who had been repeatedly raped uh, by Serb, Serbian soldiers and that her child had been beheaded in front of her and that she'd essentially gone insane. And that prompted me to make one of several trips to Bosnia eventually to take aid and uh, um, on aid convoys and for a short period of time, period of time even joined the international um, brigade of the Bosnian volunteer force which was part of the Bosnian army for about a couple of months in a, in a I think a fit of rage because of the, the devastation that I saw in that country uh, I eventually returned uh, I didn't take part in the fighting it was during the winter months I think I probably would have had um, it availed itself the opportunity but I was forever changed as a result of what I'd seen and um, my sense that the community that I felt that I was now part of, i.e. the Muslim world Muslim community, uh, required assistance and required help and I had, was duty bound to do that once I'd seen what I'd seen. Um, I remained in Britain for a few years during that time. I got married, I had a, my wife was Palest from Palestine, or originally from Palestine. Um, we had uh, three wonderful children before we made the decision to travel to Afghanistan um, in 2001 and people often ask why would you do such a thing why would you go to Afghanistan it was run by the Taliban at the time and it was a place that abused the human rights of ordinary people but I knew that I didn't formulate my view of anything based upon hearsay and based upon just media reports alone but something that I wanted to go and examine for myself more importantly I'd, I had understood that the Taliban were not allowing female education and I had friends who'd come back from there and told me that they were uh, they wanted to build a, a school or schools for girls and would I be involved would I um, be involved in a project that would help to build and to make curriculums for those schools for education so I jumped at the idea of of trying to assist a country where in the Muslim world um, we could do something like this something of, of benefit to the local population, something that didn't have a Western agenda stamped on it, um, but it could still benefit from Muslims who'd come from the West. And so in 2001, I moved to Kabul, the capital city of Afghanistan, with my wife and children, uh, with a view to stay there for at least a year to build and to um, assist, to teach in this school uh, for girls. And it was built. I remember that. Um, a few weeks later, after 9-11, the first cruise missile, uh, cruise missile attacks happened not too far from my home. In fact, um, I remember feeling the, the aftershocks of the cruise missiles and the, the ground shaking underneath our feet. The windows uh, of most of the houses on my road cracked and smashed. And I took all the children from my house and from the neighboring houses into a, a, a cellar, which, which I had. Um, to, for protection and I and I remember thinking that this place is going to be our place of refuge or it's going to be our communal grave and I remember also before this is that before the Americans dropped these bombs uh, they dropped leaflets we'd see the airplanes fly over and they would sprinkle literally these leaflets that would fall as Donald Rumsfeld later said like snowflakes in Chicago in December um, that offered on these leaflets, $5,000 bounty money for each foreign Muslim who people thought may be Al-Qaeda suspects um, and that this bounty money would come to them once these people had been handed over. I remember the fear and the turmoil and the, uh, the terror, that's the only way you can describe it, the terror of evacuating under these bombs and I remember seeing the, the results of the vacuum bombs or the 15,000 pound daisy cutters that I learnt that these um, ordnance pieces were and just so that people have an idea that's a bomb that weighs 15 tons that's the closest thing that you can have to the use of nuclear weapons in conventional warfare and it was in the wake and in the view of all of this that I took my family out and eventually after a, a difficult few weeks of being separated from them for a while 
and crossing mountains and perilous um, bounty hunters being uh, all over the place, uh, I managed to take up residence again in Pakistan, which is, of course, where my parents originate from. And I remained there for a couple of months, working to help other refugee families. I'm a fluent speaker in Urdu and in Arabic and in English and use my uh, language skills to assist people, take them to hospitals, take them to clinics and so forth, help to reunite families. It was a time of turmoil. And uh, of course, um, unbeknownst to me, uh, a deal had been struck between the American government, the British government and the Pakistanis that people like myself and many others were going to be picked up and rounded up and taken off to secret detention sites around the world. It was a night on the 31st of January 2002. There was a knock on my door. I was at my house in Islamabad in the capital Pakistan. There was, of Pakistan, there was a knock on my door at midnight. I opened it to be faced by a group of people, all of them ununiformed, unidentified, uh, carrying guns and uh, electric stun guns or tasers were crackling in the background. And they forced their way without saying anything without asking me who I was, without producing any identification, into the forecourt of my house. They made me kneel onto my, uh, onto my knees with a gun to my head. They tied my hands behind my back, tied my legs, put me into the prone position. And the last thing I saw, before they covered and blacked out my life for the next three years, was my wife walking towards me in tears. And then they put the hood over my head, put me into the back of a vehicle and carried me off to a secret location site. Nonetheless, I was taken to this secret location um, run by the Pakistanis. The Pakistanis would speak to me in, in, in Urdu, which is the language uh, that I speak, and would apologize. And they'd say son, or in Urdu, beta, which is like a term of endearment for a child, for, for somebody who's younger than you. And they'd say, we know you haven't done anything wrong. You're not wanted in this country for anything. You're not wanted. You're not even wanted in your own country. But it's the Americans, and they've told us that if you do not, if we do not cooperate with you, then we will be struck so hard that we will never be able to recover. And one of the Pakistani intelligence agents actually said to me that, uh, please understand this, you have been illegally detained. And I said, what does that mean? I, I, I studied law as a child, but I don't know what illegal detention means other than it's unlawful and that it's wrong. He said, you've been illegally detained by us and that means that we, because we're the power of the country, can do things that are essentially illegal and there's nobody to hold us to account for it. So here you are and that's the end of it. We're just here to facilitate your interrogations with the Americans. But of course for me as a Briton, it wasn't just Americans, it was the British. Now it's important at this point that I point out that the British involvement in this is crucial. I could only have remained in Guantanamo because of what the British government did. And in 1998, three British intelligence officers turned up at my house in the morning to ask me about the case of an individual who'd written me a letter asking for an international lawyer. And this is somebody who I'd met in the mosque and got to know and told me that he's traveling and um, that he believes that there are intelligence services who are interested in him. Uh, eventually he went to one of the Middle Eastern countries and he was stopped, detained there, tortured and beaten into giving false confessions and from prison he wrote to me this letter. And it was in relation to this case that the MI5 or the British Security Services first came to my house asking me about this man. And it was because of this man's case that I first approached my lawyer before I went to Guantanamo who later became a, a, a very close friend and confident and somebody who's well known in, in Britain as the most, um, the most prolific human rights lawyer, and that's Gareth Pierce. But this event was very important because the same intelligence agent who sat in my front room in my house in the reception and to whom I offered tea was the same intelligence agent then who turned up in Pakistan three years later demanding that I cooperate with the Americans and that the only way I could be released from this place is by cooperating and answering every single question without the presence of a lawyer, sometimes with a gun pointed to my head and of course as later time went on, whether it was in Bagram, the uh, 
the U.S. detention facility in Afghanistan or Kandahar or Guantanamo, this same intelligence agent appeared again and again and then again like a ghost haunting me. Um, and once again saying that there's nothing we can do to help you or your family. Uh, you are in the control of the Americans and we do not run the show. And so I understood from this um, that there's, there's no way out. I'm the Paki, I'm the Muslim, I'm, if I had any doubts about who I really was and my identity was, that he just told me, you're not British. At least as far as this period is concerned. You're not really part of our society. And we're going to deal with you outside the scope of law. Habeas corpus will not apply to you. Um, the presumption of innocence will not apply to you. The right to family life and meaningful communication will not apply to you. You will be sent to Guantanamo Bay. Um, and I remember that uh, once the whole period of the, the intermittent interrogations had taken place with the Pakistani, with the Americans, facilitated by the Pakistanis. Um, at the last moment, I thought that perhaps someone's going to see sense and then really not going to send me to these various detention camps. But they took me, I remember, and several other people hooded uh, to this airport. We heard the sounds of aircraft coming and landing. And then I heard American voices. And I saw camouflaged khaki boots and trousers, and I realized this is the military. And they weren't joking. And I remember speaking, just speaking, and the very fact that there's a group of prisoners here in, in traditional Pakistani clothing, clothing uh, looking l like they don't speak English, that I shocked one of the American soldiers when I spoke English. And I said, are you going to abuse us? He said, no, son, we don't do that. And then that's exactly what he did. They stripped us naked. They um, tied us and shackled us, put on blue suits at the time, it wasn't orange, and then took us onto the aircraft and tied me and every other prisoners down to the floor with my hands tied behind my back, my legs shackled, a strap, a cargo strap put across my legs. I was on a C-130 uh, US transport plane. I could hear the sounds of dogs barking, of prisoners screaming. I could make out the flashes of the camera despite this hood over my head. I could hear uh, the swear words being hurled at us in the new, newly learned Arabic words that some of these soldiers from must have learnt. Uh, and um, I remember that uh, one of the soldiers, he came up to me and he'd heard me speaking to one of the prisoners who were on my left-hand side. And he said that if you speak, I'll slit your throat. This was my introduction to being a prisoner of the United States of America. We were flown then to the Kandahar detention facility where we landed and uh, we were all transported literally in the bowing position. And our hands behind our back, my hood, my head hooded, and then thrown onto the floor again. A knife, that same knife I think that uh, I'd been threatened with was, I could feel it cutting across my trousers and my underclothing and everything else feel, glide ac across my skin as my clothes were sliced off and then um, being dragged naked, again in the bowing position, to an interrogation tent where there were officers from the FBI who were asking standard questions of every prisoner. Um, this is the first, my first encounter with Americans at this level. Uh, I, I'd never been to America, but America had been to me and was showing me a face of it that I didn't even know existed. And then I was taken, we were taken. I'd watch, first of all, this happening to other prisoners and then anticipate it happening to me. 
the prisoner was thrown on the floor, punched and kicked, uh, shaved forcibly like a sheep, spat upon, dogs were brought again to salivate over uh, him, and then photographed and doused with, I think, lime, and then moved on to the interrogation tent and clothed in, in orange suits, and then my term came and they did exactly the same thing with me. I tried my best not to scream or to shout or to respond or to give them the satisfaction of um, hearing me in pain. But what do you do when you've got shackles cutting into your skin? What do you do when someone's pushing your shoulders back so far you think it's going to come out of its socket? What do you do when somebody's shaving off your hair and your beard and you don't even recognize yourself if you had a mirror to look in? Um, what do you do when somebody spits on you, when a dog comes and snarls over you, think it's going to bite at any moment? And so for me, this was, this was, this was America. This was the America I was going to see for the next three years. Uh, I was eventually taken into a, a disused barn that had been converted into a, a, a series of holding cells that had been divided by concertina or razor wire. There were American soldiers pointing M16s at us 24 hours a day along with the floodlights. It was impossible to sleep. Uh, the soldiers would sometimes would throw stones at the metal roof of this barn in order to keep us awake. Some of the prisoners I'd see who were being treated much worse than me had, were forced to stand naked with the, their hands and their legs shackled. And it, it was unbelievable. Uh, eventually, after a whole series of <coughs> weeks, I think that just dissipated into nothingness, uh, I was sent to Bagram and I was held in Bagram detention facility for about 11 months. This was a US Again, detention site. Uh, what was bizarre about the Bagram detention facility at the time is that we were housed in a, in, in a, in a makeshift um, prison that, was, that had, had been built by the Russians. You could still see the inscription in Russian in the walls, on the machinery that was around in this, in this old factory. And I remember thinking to myself, Afghanistan is probably the poor, poorest country on earth, yet two world superpowers within two decades have invaded this place. Wh why? And again, I was housed inside these cells, communal cells, um, where there were about 10 of us in each cell. The cells were um, again, uh, uh, separated by concertina or razor wire. Uh, there was a, an open toilet, there was a bucket, it was, in fact it was, a, it was a barrel that had been cut in half that was used as a communal toilet. And uh, it was dehumanizing, it was degrading, it was inhuman. Uh, the lights would be on 24 hours a day from the floodlights. There were soldiers walking around us continuously with guns pointed at us. And we weren't allowed to get up we weren't allowed to walk, we weren't allowed to talk, we weren't allowed to uh, gesture or to make signals or to, to do anything like that. Uh, and if we did, we were taken to the front of the cell, our hands tied above the top of the cage and left suspended there with a hood placed over our heads for hours, sometimes days on end. And it was during my time in Bagram that I came across um, several soldiers who again were regarding us as, as the most dangerous prisoners but others who were not so, others who I could speak to and communicate with and for the first time actually have a sense of understanding of one another's humanity and so I developed uh, sorts of friendships of sorts with some of the, the, the soldiers at the time and these soldiers I think they were disturbed with what they saw, by what they saw, and some of them didn't want to be part of it. But they were part of a military machine which um, you're either part of or, or if you're against it then you are with the terrorists. And the pressure was immense on some of these kids who just left school in some cases. The worst part for me was in particularly in May of 2002, I was put through an interrogation by the CIA 
and the FBI during the interrogation that one CIA agent sat across me, he didn't blink for, for an hour, literally looking at me, two FBI agents continually asked me questions about my beliefs, about my whereabouts, about where I'd been, what I had done in my life and so forth. And at the end of that interrogation, the two FBI agents left the room. The CIA agent looked their remaining and didn't move again, didn't blink and with his gun in one hand and his hand uh, making the gesture of the Caesars of the past in the other, he said, Ma'azam Beg, and made that um, gesture. And he said to me that uh, we'll be making a decision about you very shortly. They took me off and put me into a room, again hand, uh, shackled my hands behind my back to my legs and I was then interrogated once more and told that they had decided to send me to Syria uh, or to Egypt. In the end, I don't know what prevented them from sending me either to Syria or to Egypt, but I was thankful that I wasn't sent there. Instead, I remained in Bagram for several more months and I saw two prisoners being beaten to death, including one called uh, Dilawar, a taxi driver, who was tied up in my cell um, with his hands above his head to the top of a cage. And after his body had slumped, it was evident that he needed medical treatment. The soldiers opened the cell door, they came in, and while he was, his body was hanging, with his head slumped down and his body limp, they started to punch him repeatedly to see if he was putting it on. And then they dragged his, his, his body off to, to interrogation cells. We heard some more screams. I think he was still alive for a short while, and then after that, shortly, he died. And in February 2003, I was taken onto another US transport plane, placed on top of, on a seat with my hands tied to what's known as a three-piece suit. It's a shackle that goes around your waist to your hands, attached at one end, and then uh, goes down, a chain goes down to your ankles. And my ears had ear defenders, again, blacked out goggles and a mask a face mask over my mouth. I couldn't even scratch my nose if I, could, if I knew where it was at that time. And it was in this state uh, that I arrived in Guantanamo and was taken to maximum security isolation block in Camp Echo, which was inside a tiny little cage, which I was told was a shipping container that had been cut in half and converted into a cage. And this cage was inside a room, a windowless room, where I remained now. I remained for the next almost two years. The same interrogators who'd come with the, uh, the FBI and the CIA came to Guantanamo literally a few days later. They threatened and said to me that if you do not sign this confession that we've prepared for you, we will be sending you to a court here and you will have a summary trial where it is possible that you could be executed. And I would have to say that there are many things that helped me to survive that period, but it would be remiss of me to say the soldiers weren't part of the reason why I survived. Those decent, good soldiers who sometimes would bring me a piece of fish that they'd captured off in the, in, in the Guantanamo coast, or whether it's a chocolate one of them had bought me that had been produced in England as a, as a, um, as a gesture of solidarity. It were these tiny little things that they did that I think to this day that's the reason why I don't hate America and Americans. Uh, as for me and my reaction to it all, after telling yourself for all of these years you're not a father and you're not a husband and so forth, it gets to you, so you become a little cold. So whatever tears I had, and I had a lot in Bagram and Guantanamo, they'd all dried up by now. And the impact of, of all of this was going to manifest itself not in conversations over tea or dinner with my wife and, and kids. So it was going to manifest itself in the middle of the night when everyone's asleep, waking up sometimes screaming, sometimes blowing up at the families, at the children, sometimes not being able to cope, sometimes just wanting to walk away, simultaneously knowing that I've been gifted with abilities that I only discovered because of Guantanamo, and that is to speak, to challenge, 
to advocate for the others. And that's what I began doing when I, after I returned from Guantanamo. I felt, I knew that there were several people, there were still hundreds of people in Guantanamo when I was released, it was over 500, and that um, I'm duty bound to campaign for them to make sure that everybody knows what was done in their name and what continues to happen. And that what my little section of the story is will help to fill a gap. And I promised, I remember, I told the American soldiers and the interrogators, I don't care how, how long I'm held here and whatever you do to me, I will go and tell the world about these murders that I've witnessed. And you can say whatever you want, it's a fact and you will have to accept it. And eventually it was accepted that murders took place in, Guan, in Bagram. But it didn't make any difference because to this day, nobody's really been held to account for these deaths. Um, I know since my return, I've been campaigning for people in Guantanamo and beyond and the effects of the war on terror and the causes of quote unquote radicalization as a result of that war on terror. I've tried to make a difference in the lives of people by saying that although there is this great injustice that was done and continues to be done, it is not my experience and the experience of the majority of the Guantanamo prisoners that we hold bitterness, anger, hatred or animosity towards our tormentors. After all, if I was to hope to do the same as they did to me, then that means they would have become my teachers. But they are not. And I have particular principles and views that are based upon my Islamic faith that tells me not to allow your oppressor to become your teacher. And so uh, as a result of that, there have been several American soldiers and, and, and some interrogators who've contacted me. One of them I remember, he, he phoned and we spoke after getting uh, in touch through this the famous social media Facebook. And uh, it's amazing how many people you can discover by just trying to write what, what you remember of their name. And I discovered many of them and they discovered me. And some of them were good people then and they're good people now. Some of them were bad people then, but are good now. And one of these interrogators, I remember, he cried down the phone. And he said to me, you taught me humanity. From the conversations I used to have with you in Bagram, knowing what you were going through, knowing what we'd done to you, you taught me humanity. I couldn't sleep at night when I used to go back and see images and remember images of you and others and what we were doing to them. And one of them actually contacted me and said that I was... I had become, when I grew up, I used to watch these films and stories about Nazi concentration camp guards at Auschwitz and Belsen and elsewhere. And now, when I saw myself in Guantanamo, I thought I had become one. I'd become what I hated. <laughs>